Uh, this morning we have a subject that is more or less highly modern. I remember in Grandma's day, and Grandma was quite a character, anyone over 65 retired from human life. <laughs> they put on black, a little touch of white perhaps, a cameo pin. Of course, no hair dye ever touched their brows. They wore no makeup, flat heel shoes, and dressed almost entirely in conventional black. They then sat quietly on the porch and did the knitting, or perhaps occasionally acted as the senior hostess of some important family gathering. This was considered to be the proper way to meet the coming of the years. To do anything different was to bring considerable criticism from the neighbors. It was rather important to stay within the pattern. All this reminds us of a bit of Greek mythology. In the old classic texts, especially the Hesiod in his Theogony, the kingdom of heaven passed to Saturn, to the, who became king of the material world. He was an elderly gentleman in mythology, a uh, rather pained expression, slender to uh, distortion. He was winged sometime, but he also always carried a scythe and a, an hourglass. And in astrology at that time, he was assigned to that part of life after 65 years. Of course, um, the growth mythology goes a little further, but most people haven't noticed it. After this went on for a while, Jupiter uh, tossed Saturn out and took over the kingdom himself. And Jupiter was of an entirely different temperament. Jupiter was philosophical, and as the word implies, he was jovial. He was wise and learned, religious, had much to do with self-improvement, and also had an irresistible sense of humor. It is said he was the chief of those upon high Olympus who, observing the happenings of mankind, laughed heartily. <laughs> so, and now we find, according to the Greek mythology, that the period after 65 is under the keeping of a very jovial, happy, wise, and impressive personality who enjoyed not only the good things of life, but enjoyed learning and was the patron of wisdom and religion and most of the higher educations with which we are now associated. Now, the uh, modern statistic findings, in spite of smog pollution and other things, is that we are living longer than we ever have before. And today, it is not at all unlikely that a person retiring from a business or occupational career at 65 will have 20 good, happy, useful years to do something with. And this has been the rub up to the moment. The whole psychology of the situation has made it very difficult for the individual to make the best use of the best years of his life. In early life, we all have burdens, we have responsibilities, we have the problems of taking care of family and the community. Uh, we are more or less bound to occupations which may or may not be very satisfying to our inner lives. And then comes the time that they've all been looking for, when at last there would be freedom from this labor. The freedom was not entirely uh, without restriction, because in many cases, freedom meant to reduce the standard of living considerably, to try to get along on a pension and a little social security. These factors ensured probable physical salvation, but restricted the spending power of the individual at that time of life when he might enjoy spending it the most. So, uh, this problem of retirement begins in school when you start out. A life has to be planned. We have to uh, give proper consideration to the changing needs of our own dispositions and natures. It is not enough merely to live day by day, spend day by day, and keep all the funds that come to us going out as rapidly as possible. 
There is something to be said, therefore, for planning financial life and income and remembering that the money that we save when we're young can help us to have a much better time when we get older and know how to appreciate a good time a lot better. Also, that this type of life, in the more, old, uh, more advancing years, we have more interest in valuable good times, opportunities to do important things. So we face two restrictions. One is that the money's gone, and the second is that we hit this period of life, around 65, without any planned future. We kind of take it for granted that we are going to drift in some form of semi-comfort and pleasure uh, through the closing years of life. But these closing years can sometimes be very long and funds and opportunities and interests have a tendency to lag. The time when the person was perfectly willing and happy to settle down and do nothing and consider this a, a notable and valuable reward for a career, this type of thinking is going out of style very rapidly. We must now, therefore, begin to think of the years after business retirement, if we retire at that age, as a second career, not merely a waste of time. We cannot hope to fulfill life by sitting in front of a television set until finally we slip away into the other world. We have time to do things, and we have to have interest in doing them. So we begin to look to see what's the matter at a time when we should be preparing for a very adventurous uh, period of reasonably good health and opportunity. Well, in the first place, everyone should be a two-career person from the start. We should never be completely absorbed in one thing, especially if that one thing has physical limitations or economic limitations. The doctor, for instance, the old family physician, really didn't worry much about re uh, retirement. He never retired as long as he was able to walk. His career might extend far beyond the 60 or 70 years that was the measure of economic careerism. He was just as useful, just as happy, and just as busy as 80, at 80 as he was at 50. But in many cases, this doesn't work very fortunately. The individual who has a training in one thing comes to the point where that one thing is no longer enough or even available. And then there's a blank for which there's been no preparation. No understanding of the need to have a wider area of mental and emotional relevance, consideration of values and factors. The person, therefore, should always have a second string on his bow. Now, this can begin way back early in life, in university or in school. He may have a major and a minor. He may have two uh, definitely different courses which could help him to diversify his own interests. Business, however, has a tendency to limit him, to make him more and more isolated from the general world and centered in the particular occupation which he has accepted. Therefore, we begin to say when people are 30 or 40 or 50 years old, it is high time to begin to give a lot of thought to a secondary career. It isn't as difficult as people might imagine. Psychiatrists and psychologists realize that in many instances, the individual has a second career submerged. And it is this submerged second career that has been making life difficult for him ever since he started out. He has always had something he wanted to do and never could do, or didn't believe he could do. And as a result, it was a frustration that affected even the career in which he was properly oriented. Please, you're talking two weeks lecture ahead. <laughs> Have I got the wrong title? You've got the wrong title. <laughs>
Well, how is that? All right, we'll keep right on from here. I looked at the program before... By the time I got through, maybe you would never have known the difference. <laughs> but actually, here we are, right on the problem we're talking about. <laughs> we need second career. We come into the world, get stuck in something that we are doing, and in this state of being limited and restricted, we factually have no recourse but to go on in this rather lazy way. Well, if we're going to use this subject, <laughs> uh, we can say that we do bring some of our troubles with us into this world. In fact, many of us, I think, bring most of them. But the troubles that we bring into the world manifest in our careers we face them every time we take a job. We face them when we go to school. We find some students are active and sufficient, others limited and unable to fulfill even common educational responsibilities. We find some who are born optimists and others pessimists. And we find each individual working towards some kind of a life security. Now, it may well happen that the actual fields of endeavor which his latent talents will bring into play are not available at the environment where he is living today. It is also quite possible that the individual was in the previous life ahead of his time and is still so, that he has been dreaming of a utopian dream of the future for which he gave his previous life and the earnings and yearnings of which he brings into the present one. So we can bring into it, life as it is, all kinds of unfinished business. And the problem of what to do with our life when we get here is probably the most important of the unfinished business. So to go back to the subject we started out in, <laughs> we take a job, we work through it to retirement, and then we are lost. Whatever the compulsion is from some previous embodiment, if there was one, and that is one compulsion, has been killed by the pressures of immediate circumstances. We have gradually been forced to sacrifice ourselves and our purposes for the well-being of those around us or for whom we have unusual regard and affection. So we come in with certain talents very often have no opportunity to use those talents, and then find the end in a rather routine business situation which rewards us only financially. Well, the financial reward is important, and to some people their profession is well satisfying. They enjoy it, they do well with it, and they continue on to the end. But here again we come to this problem of how are we going to get out of the mysteries of the subconscious or that from which we have spawned the present embodiment and fulfill more of the greater part of ourselves. If it is true that we bring into here a vast amount of unfinished business, it is very probable that this unfinished business has something to do with more than earning a living. The human nature, the soul in man, is not economically oriented. The body has its requirements and most persons sacrifice all else to the requirements or satisfactions of the body. So whatever else came along has had very, very little consideration. In a highly industrialized world such as we live in now, it is quite possible that the average person in his regular career cannot afford to think, cannot afford to dream, cannot afford to hope for a better way of life. 
He must stay with what he's doing. But then comes this period in which he is no longer a servant of his physical conditions unless he chooses to be. So somewhere in this mystery is the possibility of unfolding to potentials after the burden of regimented existence is passed. So we could say that we have at least 15 or 20 years in life in which we can release parts of our nature which have had practically no expression in our daily contacts with existence. Somewhere in each person there is an inner life that must have some expression. And to go out of this world without having an opportunity to develop some of the internal initiatives of our lives is a sad and tragic but all too common thing. We are gradually changed into elements of an economic or industrial machinery. And in this we must remain until the bitter end. But with the coming of social security, pension systems, and matters of that nature, the bitter end does not have to be one of complete involvement in survival, trying to get along on a restricted income, trying to find what pleasure one can without the money to do it with. And looking back on the vast amount of money that may have been wasted along the way, which would be more useful after 65 than it was before 65, we begin to philosophize and the empire of our older years comes under the rulership of Jupiter rather than Saturn. We are all looking more than any other way and any other thing for the solution to the needs of the inner life. These are the needs that press forward out of the past. <clears throat> Actually, we think of the human being as born and dying in this world. But actually, the human being is a long creature in existence. It has survived ages. It has gone forward through degree and culture after culture. It has been part of countless civilizations. It has spoken many languages. It has followed many paths and comes now into the world with certain responsibilities and needs. It is almost certain that one of the most important traits of character that we have to develop in our present embodiment is discrimination, to find out what it is that will do the most for the greater part of ourselves. This little material island that we call the body uh, is actually surrounded and permeated by the great ocean of spiritual space. There is a tremendous universality in which we live and move and have our being. This universality tells us of the tremendous potential in ourselves, but we have very little opportunity to do, do anything with it and very little incentive. Everything that we do here narrows us more and more into the physical environment. Now, if the world environment physically was in a happy condition, if we could prove beyond question of doubt that we learn more in the material world than we can possibly digest in a lifetime, then perhaps this physical condition would be worthwhile. But for the most part, we are blocked in learning. We are prevented from thinking. We are restricted in our efforts to enlarge our own horizons or deepen our own understanding. If we depart from the conventional patterns of things, we are considered eccentric and penalized. So we bring into this world all kinds of possibilities, all kinds of arts and sciences that have some of them no longer any contemporary existence, but could well be revived for the common good. We also bring within ourselves this great hunger to grow, an infinite desire to expand and enlarge and enrich the total pattern of our existence. In order to do this, we must have time. We must have opportunity. We must have considerable interest in doing these things. Therefore, we come back again to the fact 
that we all have to buy in one way or another a certain amount of leisure time with which to use for thought. We have to pay out of our daily wages for the privilege of being th thoughtful, intelligent, conscientious persons. We are not just given this. We have to do it ourselves. The majority of persons claim that after they have done a day's work, they are too tired to consider other matters. So they waste many hundreds and thousands of hours in some kind of entertainment that does not entertain. So the planning of a time to grow brings into focus this problem of the second subject that I've just received here. <laughs> and that is, do we bring our troubles with us into this world? We do not, do not necessarily bring troubles. Rather, we bring the capacity for trouble. We bring into this world with us attitudes which can well lead to trouble. We also bring into this world a kind of freedom which has a great inducement to get us into trouble. We have the right to do as we please, and when we do it, we frequently are the worse off. So that we can bring into the world unfinished business, undisciplined attitudes, and unconditioned levels of consciousness which doom us to trouble. A, a trouble probably arises primarily from lack of experience. In some previous embodiment, we haven't learned certain lessons. So when the problems come up again, we are in a bewilderment. We are not capable of coping with them. So one of the things we have to do as we come into this world is to determine to accomplish something to get out of our own troublemaking device. We have to begin to think about things that perhaps we would rather not consider. One person may come into this world with an unconditioned, unrestricted impulse to worry. They have been a warrior perhaps for 20 lives or more. <laughs> and the more they worried, the more really they had to worry about. Because worrying was not producing any consequential results worthwhile. So the person who has been a warrior since the dawn of time comes in for a short journey here through his environment which we call daily living. He will worry himself from the cradle to the grave and in the course of doing it will probably worry nearly everyone he knows. <laughs> worry is something that gradually paralyzes his own initiatives, fills him with fears and doubts, creates burdens that are, exist only in his own mind, and finally condemns himself to a hypochondria involving not only his physical body, but his mental and emotional structure as well. So here we come. If we are worriers, and we notice that we are inclined to worry, then the thing to do is to take it on as a problem immediately. It is never too young to start. Perhaps we don't realize that it is a problem till we hit our teens or something of that nature, but the moment we notice that it is a discomfort and a restriction upon constructive effort, the time has come to go to work with it. Now another individual... Uh, coming into this life may have been a Caesar somewhere in the background or one of the generals of Alexander and he comes into the world with only one tremendous purpose ambition he feels that he is destined pre and foreordained to run people to dominate situations to become powerful and wealthy to become a great industrialist or a famous militarist he comes in for the purpose always of having his own way and dominating and enslaving the minds of those around him. As a husband, he is a terrible mistake. As a wife, no better. So that all the way along, he is a victim of an inordinate belief that he was created for the purpose of running other people. Well, in the course of life, he learns a lot of lessons and goes out of here with many scars which he never needed and perhaps and probably 
never does learn the lesson that he was supposed to learn. The lesson of gently and humbly accepting the responsibilities of daily life and contributing to the happiness and security of others rather than the do dominant development of his own career. So he has wasted a life by failing to change his own pressures of personality. Then there may be another type of person that comes along who is very strongly theologically inclined. Perhaps for many lives they were in religious houses. Perhaps they were monks or nuns or belong to some other religion in other parts of the world. But they come in with nothing on their minds, actually, but a tremendous religious intensity. Quite young in life, they probably joined some religious organization as a natural expression of their pressures, and then settle down very often to an unreasonable frustration, in which instead of growing and learning and helping and serving, they simply settle down into the idea that piety, that the constant saying of prayers, the constant reading of scriptures, and the practice of certain physical austerities will fulfill life. These people succeed in going through the entire problem of existence without actually solving any of the real pressures of their own natures. Beneath or around this religious intensity, there is always the problem of social adjustment. These people avoid that and ignore it. Instead of rising to, to meet a problem head on and solving it, they hide, taking refuge behind walls or psychological uh, shrines uh, to escape the challenge of daily living. These people are unable to cope with life. And this lack of coping is the result of having failed long ago to learn the lessons of adjustment. So they come in uh, with tremendous pressures which are uh, unable to lead them to any successful or constructive end. Then, of course, there are always those groups that arise with tremendous intensities in various fields of art, music, drama, religion, philosophy, education, science. There are the born scientists, the born opera singers, the born musicians, the child of ten who is a mathematical genius. These types of individuals come in all the time, bringing with them assets out of the past, but for the most part also bringing them with them uh, liabilities. These tremendously intense people gradually become so immersed in a particular field of activity that they forget or choose to ignore the large problems of life. They consider that if they are a great artist, they have done it all. If they can exhibit in the salon, they are a success. If they can find a new gadget uh, for some industrial house, they are inventors. Each of these persons has his own little world. And uh, history, biography, and the records that we all have show that these little worlds are not always very satisfactory. We find the great musician whose private life was a complete problem. We find a man like Richard Wagner, who was one of the great musical geniuses of all time, whose physical life was simply unbelievably confused. He never did straighten it out. Then we find somebody else who has great depths in invention and things of that nature, but has done nothing to fulfill the needs and responsibilities of a family or the raising of children or the problems of daily living. So little by little, these specialists isolate themselves from the great course of life. They forget humor. They forget the joy of living. They lose touch with nature. They become hopelessly involved in projects. Projects which belong to a world which is changing. The inventor of some gadget makes quite a reputation while he's here, but 50 years after he's gone, the gadget is obsolete. He has done nothing to perpetuate the better part of anything. So behind all specialized occupations 
all specialized careers, is the basic problem of living in this world, which appears to be the reason why we are here. Living in this world means to have a useful life, helpful, constructive, uh, cooperative. A life in which the inner nature of the individual has an opportunity to express itself through joy, through love and affection, through respect and friendship, and through mutual service to the common good. As we look at these adjustments, it becomes obvious that nearly everyone has within himself the capacity for several such adjustments, but does not make use of them. Rather, continues in his own narrow way leaving this world no better than he found it, and perhaps a little worse. This type of situation has to be faced by everyone who believes in reincarnation, who believes that they are here, as Buddha pointed out, for one reason only, that they are not perfect. If we were perfect, we wouldn't be here. If we made no mistakes because we had learned everything there was to learn, then the infinite wisdom of nature would not lock us in common circumstances again. It is what we never did well that we have to do now. It is what was never finished that has to be completed. Therefore, there is no question in the world that the mere presence of the individual here is a definite proof of shortcomings, of limitations, of course, I know we've had people come to us and they admitted all this. They said they had shortcomings, but they didn't make any difference because the thing they wanted to do, they had achieved. They had done the one thing they wanted to do. I remember one in particular who had no success in life in anything, but they were happy because they had achieved the one goal they wanted to achieve. Uh, they were singing a grand opera. Well, that was a, a goal that was pleasant and happy. But to this end, everything else was sacrificed. And it was not even regarded as a sacrifice. It was the means of the fulfillment of one pointed determination and ambition. And the uh, better economists today tell us this one pointedness is the secret of success. But when we succeed in one thing, does this success enrich all of our life? Or does it just simply give us a little satisfaction and leave us surrounded by a sea of misfortunes? Does the individual who finally came to be a singer, does that individual have a good home life? Are they happily married? Do they have wisely governed children? Are they respected in their community? Do they have a strong and sufficient religious life? Very often, the only thing they have is the thing they've specialized in. And, of course, music, like all other things, is limited to a large degree to physical existence. And the individual whose body becomes tired or whose faculties become exhausted loses the one ability that they think they have. So, we come into this world in order to learn something that we didn't know before. And to get back to the subject I talked about first, <laughs> uh, they, they're going to stay that way probably until retirement. Because up to that time they have no individuality. They are the servants of a system. They are, depend they are dependent upon an organization for a living. They must obey the will of their leaders. The head of the department tells them what they can do and often what they can think. They have all kinds of burdens, all centering on the problem of paying the rent, having food, raising a family, and trying to maintain a certain sense of contentment in an embarrassing and difficult position. So these people do not, for the most part, reach retirement with very much out of life except a job. Now, this doesn't mean that they spend all their time being miserable. They go away on vacations. They have pleasant times with their families. They uh, see the scenery. They travel. And they have develop all kinds of uh, 
uh, radio and video games and things of this nature, and some of them rise to the height of rock music. <laughs> they have a good time, and they sit and watch baseball games, and uh, sit there with the, uh, their eyes glued to the plays, and feel that that is a tremendous fulfillment. By working hard and earning the price of the TV set, they have the right to sit beside it or in front of it every evening for two or three hours to watch programs that are for the most part worthless. But this is, this is relaxation, this is success, this is the thing the individual has labored for so industriously and sometimes so painfully. Well, it goes on that way. People don't change too much in these things. Some of them develop nice and interesting hobbies. Some of them take on social activities. And there are com compensations. It's not all miserable. The individual has a kind of feeling that he's getting along as well as the next. But somewhere along the line, the problem of growth still does come into the picture. Man is a many splendid being. He's a tremendous creature. The human being is unbelievably magnificent in potential and in resources. That this individual should spend all his time uh, tightening a bolt in an automobile just does not seem to be the proper destiny. This destiny must have something else in it. Now, if he has to make a living by this tightening this bolt, that's all right. He has a right to be a make a living. But by making a living, he earns certain time for himself. He gains certain freedoms and certain liberties. Because he works, he has a home. Because he has a home, he has a vacation. He has all kinds of privileges also. But what does he do with them? Does he do anything more with his spare time than he does while he's tightening the bolt in the factory? It is just a narrow squirrel cage of activities. Now, after, by the time he gets to the point of retirement, he is more or less anxious to rest. And this problem of looking forward to rest is probably the greatest delusion in the world because there is nothing more boring after the first two weeks. <laughs> the individual with nothing to do is supremely miserable. So he has to find more artificial things to keep his mind off of his own uselessness. So he takes on all kinds of activities, perfectly aware that they don't mean anything. But after all, you just can't sit and look at the sky forever. Now there's where the growth factor could come in. If we brought back from some previous life unfinished business, we should be able to do something uh, to interpret those working years which have preceded this retirement period. We now have a life of many years of social contacts and social involvements to look back on. We can think how we handled a marriage. We can wonder if the divorce was necessary. We begin to consider what might have happened had we raised the children a little differently. And had we learned to do things that were important instead of buying that expensive car. Were we justified in putting every nickel we had into something the moment we got it, so that at, to the end of our business career, we were never more than a few months ahead of debt? Was this a good life? After we've lived it and can think about it, we can also wonder what we didn't have that might have made it better. We begin to have our own book, as a, our own life as a textbook for growth we are able to begin to estimate how we could have used things better. And the moment we make this estimation, our consciousness helps us to make these things better. It gives us the learning. The incidents do not end in learning. It is our understanding of the incidents that ends in learning. What happens is not the meaningful thing. It's what we think of what happened, what we do about what happened. What we learn from what happened that, help, that helps us to grow. These are the things that, therefore, the person can contemplate from a higher perspective of life. He also can have his religious life enriched. 
he can have all these things made more important because he does not have to conform with the requirements of an industrialized civilization. So, if he starts, say, at around 30, 40 years old, to understand these things, he can then do something to fulfill the laws of nature, the great laws of growth. Here we have in this world about nearly five billion human beings, most of whom go through the spans of life with little or no insights. The majority of people are simply wandering through the years, some of them suffering through the years, trying to understand the reason for their own existence and finally giving up in despair. They have not any real skill in understanding or estimating their own natures. Somewhere in education, there should be courses to help people to understand themselves. Not psychological courses to find out what's the matter with them, but rather philosophical and educational courses to help them to know what to do to unfold and release the potentials within themselves. It is quite obvious that, for instance, computerization is not a potential. The individual was growing long before there were computers, and he will continue to grow long after they are forgotten. The problem is, if he dotes, dotes his entire life to learning such a thing as that, he dies no wiser than before. It may not even be that these instruments will be used in use the next time he comes around. There are many things we've learned in the past that were no use and will never survive. But what we had to learn in the past was how to grow. And if we didn't learn that, all the rest was a mistake or a failure. Now, if we have a sneaking suspicion that we do have some unfinished business, and I think we should all believe that we have because we are all unfinished beings, there is no evidence that the human being has as yet been completed, even in his physical structure or his psychological uh, patterns. He is in, uh, en route to tomorrow in all cases. And the future involves knowledge, wisdom, insights, and understanding that have to gradually develop over many embodiments. But now is the time to recognize that if there's anything about you that is different from what other people think and have, there's a reason for it. And if you are a person, then as a person you are growing up in a world of persons. And the growth process has to do with the achievement of cosmic citizenship. It has to the achievement of a completeness of self which enables us to unfold without restraint the incredible potentials of our own inner lives. All of this true growth comes through the unfoldment of potential, not merely the education of the concrete mind in techniques. It is the person growing up. Now what is that person really like? How do we know that person? What is this being that we would like to be and yet uh, we somehow have not even a speaking acquaintance with? Well, probably the answer is that we will never know exactly until we become far wiser than we are now. But there are certain uh, guideposts, there are certain landmarks that can help us to understand. Uh, the person that we would like to be or the being that we would like to equal is in most cases one of the world's great teachers, one of those who have become the spiritual and philosophical leaders of the race. The great examples are uh, beings like Buddha, Confucius, Christ, all of these great teachers whom we have identified with the highest nobility of our attributes, characteristics, and talents. Somewhere in each of us is this universally learned being. How to get to it, what to do about it, is always difficult. But we also know that the intellect isn't much help. It helps to some things. It helps us to understand the reason for things. It helps us to think through the projections of our own memories. But in some mysterious way, there is another power, the heart, 
which alone seems to be able to sense the realities. The heart seems to tell us that the works of the mind have limitation and that the consequences and rewards of mental exertion are often futile. Whereas the rewards of the heart gradually outgrowing selfishness, outgrowing cupidity, jealousy, hatreds, and all these things uh, gradually releases us into a larger dimension of existence. So we are all looking for something to help out in these ways because we do know that we are imperfect. We do know that something more is necessary. Now in that particular case, how are we going to think about it? Well, to be going back to my first idea, I think the only way to think about that is through a time in which the mind is rescued from these pressures and allowed to think its own thoughts. A mind that has escaped from the tyranny of future ambition. The individual of 80 is not going to be quite as ambitious as the person of 40 or 50. Ambition is not going to force corruption. Ambition is less likely to cause the individual to, to disfigure his psychic nature. He is not likely to be as selfish, as cruel, or dogmatic, or tyrannical as a person in younger years, simply because his older faculties are instinctively somewhat improved by the experiences of life whether he knows it or not whether he realizes it or declines to accept it the fact remains so in that period the individual can really begin to find out what he owes the universe what is his debt to existence itself and how he can pay it in the years that he is here he will know perfectly well that he can't pay it with money because most people do not have that kind of money and it wouldn't do it if they had but he does have opportunities to find out more about his own life and I think in the early days this was one of the points of that were, were emphasized in the mystery teachings namely that as we become to the end of mortal existence we begin to get a flickering glimpse of eternal existence we suddenly realize that if there is something beyond the grave, then there is hope. If there's nothing behind the grave, then we have wasted and futilized the life. Because nothing that we are having and doing here has sufficient permanence for ourselves or anyone else to justify the cost in the corruption of our own character. So in the older years, the person naturally begins to think wonder. He begins to, as Carl Jung points out, he begins to get rid of the useless burdens that have bound him to, uh, to younger years. He is helped to this by circumstances. If he has a family, it has grown up. It is no longer dependent upon him. Therefore, the person, man or woman, who comes to the point of, eight, of older years does have a special allotment of time enriched by memories and enlightened by experience. Now, the person may not even know this. They may be so busy being sorry for themselves or disliking someone else that it never occurs to them that they have gradually been working up to the real reason for their own lives and that as long as they are concerned only with the extension of physical matters or feel themselves to be completely comfortable in an embodied condition, these other situations are going to be overlooked or neglected. After we get a little further along then, we also begin to say, what are the, what are the soul factors which we are most likely to neglect in our daily work? One of the soul factors is expense. How to spend what we have. What are we doing in our extravagances or moderate expenditures that has, what are we doing that has significance to the inner life of the person? I think my, perhaps Muhammad summarized that better than most others in the simple statement at least attributed to him. And when he said, if I had two coats, I would sell one of them 
and by sight higher sense for my soul. Now, somewhere in this problem, the, uh, the problem of purchasing soul value comes into pattern. Uh, that somehow, no matter how, more, how beautiful or extravagant our home is, it is not a home unless the soul power is there. Something has to be transmuted into the love of beauty, the love of good, and the unselfish service of others. Something has to lead us to an eternal faith in the omnipotence of good and the omniscience of all that is necessary to our well-being. This type of thing should start a little earlier so that we have time to build these patterns into our daily living. But for the most part, sufficient to the day is what we want to spend that day, and that is where it ends. But if we can plan things, we can say to ourselves, I am now building up a series of values which I want to understand later. I want to build up also an expression, a, an action, most, most people live vicariously. They think their way through life or they emotionalize, emotionalize their characters and careers. But every constructive value in life must be supported by an action. There must be something done. There must be a skill developed. There must be a discipline of the body and the mind. There must be a purpose for which we will sacrifice lesser things among those lesser things ourselves. So little by little, by contemplation and the proper use of time, we can begin the process of rescuing uh, perhaps the desert, the deserted garden that is within ourselves. We didn't take care of it, we allowed it to go to weed because we were busy taking care of career. But now that the career problem is no longer pressing, we live in a house, in a garden, that needs care. We need to redo the things that we neglected to do. And we have to build back values which bring consolation and comfort to the inner life and are important for an eternal pattern. We can therefore find nearly all the instruction that we need simply by looking back over the years of our own lives. We can remember what happened when we were children. And we can say to ourselves, it was difficult. Uh, some have had a very light and beautiful childhood. Others had a very difficult one. Those who had the light, the happy childhood, what did they do with it? Only they know. Those who had the unhappy life, what did they do about that? They only are the ones who know. It may well be that they have never gotten over that unhappy life, and that's the last thing they're going to remember when they leave here. They never transmuted it. They never understood it. They never learned any lesson from it. It was only a horrible experience which had to be blamed upon the cruelty of others. Actually, all of these experiences, the broken home, the unfortunate marriage, all of these things have meaning. Most of them indicate shortcomings in ourselves, although we usually blame them on other people. But regardless of where the blame lies, what did we do about it? How did we handle it? What did we make out of it that made us better people? What did we do when we found a good friend? What did we do when we realized that our friend was imposing on us? All these values present us with problems. Most of them ignored at the time they happened, but can be restored from memory to form a textbook for the reorganization of our understanding of life so that we may actually know when we leave this world this time that we are wiser in those choices and decisions which must lead to the final liberation of the human being from the illusions of mortality. So we can say that it's all one pattern anyway. That from the past comes unfinished business and when we slip out of here in the 80s or 90s or whenever it is, there will be some unfinished business go with us. We will not have solved it all. But have we made one definite step in the direction of restoring our faith in deity, our strength in universal law? Are we more and more firm in ethics and in the integrities of life? Are we convinced 
of the ultimate victory over li of life over death and of good over evil? Do we live in a world of inner strength in which we have gradually weeded out all the weaknesses that might have restricted our growth? If we can say clearly that we have done at least a little of this kind of work, we can face the future with a much better hope. Also, it is an opportunity for many people to understand the world a, a much better. At this time particularly, where political issues are extremely tense, where crises are everywhere in the air, the individual needs a better understanding of humanity than most have. We depend for our understanding largely upon reports, television programs, or the incessant line of books by informed sources. Most of these informed sources are not very encouraging, and they tell us very, very little about the hearts and minds of other people. If we do not like certain people, we can find nothing good in them. If we do not uh, find good, we cannot cooperate. Little by little, our entire environment, which we are supposed to learn to understand, becomes all out of focus and becomes a mass of fears, doubts, hazards, and uncertainties. But in our older years, we can travel a little at least. We can visit some of these places. We can understand them. We can re uh, actually enroll in a school if we want to and study international relations or studied uh, diplomatic courses so that we get gradually get a little idea of the facts of things because mostly we work from prejudice and prejudice works from ignorance. We do not understand the great motions of society. We do not know how to cooperate with them intelligently. So we take something and say this is good and something else this is bad and have a terrible time trying to decide what political candidate we want to vote for because we're not sure we know that any of them know what they're doing. So all this type of thing we have to do something about. And little by little we can transform ourselves into knowing mechanisms that have the ability and the skill uh, to solve problems, uh, to understand properly. And the more we understand, the more we can cooperate with life. The less we understand, the more certainly we will compete with everything. So cooperation and not competition is the life of man's inner maturity. Therefore, we say it's good to believe that we have been here before. How else are we going to explain life? How are we going to get any moral value out of the fact that perhaps we inherited uh, some certain negative trait from a remote ancestor who was hung for murder. Are we disposed to believe that this antiquity, this heredity, is going to hang over us for the rest of our lives? Are we going to be the victims forever of things that have made us unpleasant and uncomfortable and for which we never have been to blame? This would make the universe look very strange. It would be amazing indeed if this world was filled with people who were all perfect except for what other people had done to them. That the individual uh, was not to blame for anything. Or, of course, there is another school that simply says, don't worry about it, there never was anything. This doesn't work very well either. It's hard to imagine that a universe so beautifully and mathematically exact as ours had no purpose in its own existence. It is much wiser to believe that it's here for a reason and that in that universe we are here for a reason. Well, the most common idea of a reason would be the concept of uh, Aquinas of the restricted or limited individualism. The right of each individual to create his own life and his own destiny. Therefore, we are here, apparently, to overcome the tendencies to be useless or to accept dismally the disasters which we ourselves have caused for the most part. If then, if there is a reason, the sooner we get to work on it, the better. 
We have people who spend a whole lifetime trying to find out who uh, uh, built one of the pyramids down in Babylonia somewhere. We have people who explore every conceivable issue. But we do not have enough people as yet who explore the reason why the human being is unable to cope with his own life. Because he doesn't try hard enough. He doesn't really work at it. He passes it all off as due to unfortunate social conditions. If he has a headache, it's pollution. If he has something else, it's nuclear fission. If he is poor, it's because of Wall Street. If he's rich, it's because somebody else has lost. All these different attitudes are unimportant. The real thing is that we move through a world which we will never be really part of. We move in an environment that changes even while we are changing. We are moving out of a past that we do not remember into a future which we cannot intellectually conceive with any certainty. So in all of this proposition, we have things to learn here and now. And if we're going to happen to have the another 15 or 20 years of life in which to learn some of these things, the least we can do is try to learn something good, learn something of the beauty of life, begin to understand the wonders of it all. Look not into the puddles, but look rather into the light and the sky. Begin to take a greater interest in the flowering of a tree than we do in the political machinations of our contemporaries. Let us begin to find the wonders of life and see if we can't find out of all of that something that is a consoling realization of the wonder of our own purpose. We are here for very definite reasons. We are here because it is a blessed privilege to be here. It is, we are here because this is the present step on our road to eternity. We are on a long journey. This is one day. And on this day, like those who travel, we go to Hong Kong to see the sites, we go to Rome to see the Vatican, we go to Egypt to see the pyramids, and we come into birth to see the world around us, to explore it, to examine it, to understand it, and to give credit to those who have helped to make it better and find ways to serve those who have been unable to make it better, but must learn in due time. So if we are here, we are observers. That's what Plato said. They asked him what his profession was. He said, I am by profession an observer. I want to know what's happening. I want to understand it. And each one of us wants to do this in one way or another. We want to take the bitterness out of life and find the reason for it. We want to understand why things aren't always the way we want them to be, but at the same time learning how we can make them a little better. We want to find justice, integrity, and find all this strange mystery of life involved within a divine love that is inevitable and unfailing. We just want to find reason, purpose, meaning. We want to really have a full life and not be forced to look everywhere for an escape from the boredom of our own ignorance. So in this type of thinking, uh, I think that uh, probably one of the best things that the average person could do would be to take the life that he has lived and become his own biographer. He could take a nice little time off somewhere along the line and make an outline of everything that he consciously remembers about his own life. Beginning as far back as he can go, he can put down the credits and debits. He can explain the way he was hurt or the way he felt. He can explain why he believed himself to be understood or misunderstood, usually the latter. He can also, why did he marry that person? What well, was they right in the way they handled the children? Did they work out a way of, that was compatible? Did the family itself have closeness? Or was it a com competition between husband and wife? Do the uh, new children, the grandchildren that, they, that come along, are we able to do something with them that is useful? How can we find out day by day what we did that was right and what we did that was wrong and learn to grow from it? 
Instead, we can, we can turn our own lives into laboratories in which we can keep records of a tremendous complication of procedures and functions. Well, it may be that as we go along, we find so much unfinished business that there's not much chance of our getting through with it even in 20 years. But we can start, and we can gradually become aware of what has been called the importance of living. Uh, Lin Yu Tang wrote a book on that subject, this the importance of living. That regardless of everything else, to, to be alive is a major circumstance, a very significant experience in the mysterious flow of life. Therefore, to find the importance of living, it must tell us something. Now, if we do take anything with us beyond the grave, if there is a life beyond, it's obvious that most of the things we're doing now are not going to be very meaningful beyond the grave. Uh, we may become the greatest banker in the world, uh, but where there are no banks, this is not especially significant achievement. <laughs> Uh, we may decide that we are the greatest artist who ever lived, but we will be brought down to humility when we understand the supreme artistry of creation itself. We may think that we were the ruler of a great nation, that we conquered one nation after another and became high pontiff over all of them. But over there, there aren't any nations to rule, and there are no armies to fight battles for us. Then uh, we can go into other fields. We learned so very, very hard. We, we did everything possible so that we could write a great book on the history of the automobile, how it started, when it went to, and how we were able to get a few antique cars that are worth their weight in gold. And as owners, we are famous people. Now, after we depart from here, what does all this mean? Nothing. All that we can take with us would be a memory, perhaps, of the history of antique cars. But out where the sky and the clouds and the mysteries of life are, nobody cares. Uh, there's no future in it. If there is a future, because we know something, it's very probable everybody else there knows it too, so there's still no value particularly. What can we take with us? that really is going to become a letter of introduction for a new day in the world. What can we take that cannot uh, fail to meet the universal approval? Well, it seems that about all any of us can ever take with us into another life is ourselves, with whatever constructive adjustments we have made with society. If we have developed integrities and values. We can take these with us. We can take lessons we have learned. We can also take various values of religious intensity that we have studied or explored. Only things that benefited conduct that gave us greater vision and restored the integrities of life in our own souls. Those are the things we have to take with us. And most people haven't had much time to study those subjects and haven't done much studying with it even if they did. So, while we have lots of time, we can begin to realize what is possible. We can realize that the good deed that we do it may recommend us to a better life. The promises that we did not fulfill have no value. But all that is good in nature, all that is valuable, is shared in man's common love of serving his fellow creatures. The individual whose life is dedicated to service has the richest life, the most meaningful life, a life in which a warm, quiet, gentle sympathy with life has become a guiding principle. And when we get out of that terrible rush that most people are in and can settle back, we can begin to love the world, which we have learned to doubt because of our involvement. We also begin to understand through the dispositions of people who have hurt us. 
we begin to realize that just as they have hurt us, we knowingly or unknowingly have hurt other people. Largely it is due to ignorance. As long as we have the power to hurt and use that power, we are not wise. It is only when we can be good only because we cannot be anything else that we are good. So we can little by little forgive in others that which we still have in ourselves in the form of purposes and projects incomplete. So if we bring with us into the life of karma, that's all right. It's a perfectly good thing to bring along. And we are probably going to have to face it for quite a while to come because it's not going to get well uh, with uh, uh, the few times and few years we have here all at once. I, I think that uh, the best person, the best way to figure this is that approximately the life wave for humanity, according to those who have given a lot of thought to it at least, is that the human life wave functions in approximately 800 incarnations. In other words, we have 800 visits here in which to do all kinds of things. Now, of course, we're not at the beginning of the visits at this time. We are well into the number. Perhaps if we've gotten to be fairly thoughtful about a number of things, we may have been back 300 times. We've gotten rid of a lot of the very crude mistakes that, we've, that the ancients made. And now we have to go to work on the sophisticated mistakes that we are making for ourselves. Little by little, however, the individual gains the powers of virtues for which he was fashioned. Somewhere in the future of things, the individual is going to be more than he is now. He is going to be more important than he is now. He is part of the great chain of leaderships of governorships and followings that go all the way through space. He is part of a great system which includes all the stars in the cosmos, all the universes, and all the dark holes in them. He is part of something that goes on and on and has a triumphant destiny. The soul in himself is the thing that growing up it will cause him someday to be called forth and rewarded and told that he has been a good and faithful servant and that now he is going to come, to come into his reward. This becoming a faithful servant leads we do not know where now. Maybe it leads out into space. Maybe someday each of us will be responsible for a star or a planet. Perhaps each of us will create a whole order of life within ourselves and then like kindly parents or the great Buddhas of the past to sit and meditate protecting the souls that have come out of ourselves. Actually, we're not so far from that if you think about it, because each one of us has inside of himself a race of beings dependent upon him that is more numerous than the stars in the sky. Every cell, every atom, is a little world over which man has a certain government. With the tyranny, he destroys his own body and all the life in it. But someday, it may be his destiny to preside over a creation which has emerged out of his own soul, which is part of himself, and which he must also lead to liberation. All of these things are parts of the great philosophies and thoughtfulnesses of life. And uh, when you're sitting around being a little quiet, we might be able to sacrifice a few commercials for detergents and think about some of these things. <laughs> It might do as well. Also, it might give us incentives. It might prove to us why it's necessary to do some of these things. Why can't we just all get out of here, lie down, go to sleep forever? Nature simply couldn't do it that way. Because nature does not work and build for millions of years to end the thing in a cipher. It is not possible to assume that anything that exists is purposeless. And it is also proper to assume that all purpose things are evolving, revealing more and more of their purpose for existence. Little by little we are all growing up to the fullness of the purpose for ourselves. It may be a long way off, but we are not little forlorn creatures chased from one jungle to another by circumstances. 
we are part of a great life wave when it comes and it seems that wars de uh, cut down our youth when it seems that tr tyrannies of all kinds uh, interfere with the natural growth of things we have to realize that nothing is destroyed nothing is lost no lesson is useless or worthless no suffering is without merit there is something behind it all and the sooner we begin to realize this the happier we're going to be and the more useful we will become then it may well be that between 65 and 80 or 85 or 90 whatever it happens to be we can really build a complete life that we can have the life that was denied us when we had to go out and make a living the first half of our physical existence we make a living in the second half we make a life and if we do it that way it may be very valuable and it also will bring a lot more consolation and will bring people closer together and we will serve each other more honorably and lovingly and everyone will find that as long as he has an ounce of strength in him anywhere he can help something or someone little by little therefore out of helpfulness we gain an unfoldment of soul power and the soul in us is forever seeking to become part of that great cosmic soul which has it as its purpose the salvation of all that lives we are part of that which is living to be saved and that is all we are also part of that power which in the due course of time becomes part of the saving soul of infinity all these things kind of give us something to think about make life a little more pleasant more meaningful and end boredom because when we start to think about these things the thoughts go on and on and on there just is no end to the thinking and as long as all that thinking is beautiful cheerful helpful hopeful it keeps the life better maintains health and the person who in their in their older years is busy serving truth will have fewer uh, ailments than the person who sits around and does nothing but be sorry for himself or regret his own existence good constructive idealistic attitudes are valuable in preserving function and helping to make the mid material life we live uh, happier and wiser and in many ways help us to contribute to the happiness of our children and grandchildren and everyone involved there's nothing but that is more helpful than a happy enlightened dedicated person and if we can achieve that after we get through fighting out the struggle of business we will then have a complete life but until that there's quite a lot to be desired and with the almost certain extension of life even in spite of all the problems we have we're living now three to five years more than we did 50 years ago those extra years are something that is a bonus not just because we can live off social security but because in those years we can begin to live and think and dream and hope without being completely bound into an industrial pattern that may have frustrated most of our lives so with a little good thinking in that direction it, it seems to me we have a lot of possibility uh, for the future and everyone who studies as we are trying to study and seeking to know will find the proof of the value of the study in the fact that they can face the future happily and that they will find that life is not only necessary but as Bragdon called it the beautiful necessity is our life here it is a beautiful thing if we know how to use it and the sooner we know how to use it the more fruitful the more valuable the more worthwhile it will become and it becomes obvious that no matter what it costs us in effort it's worth it if the end is the achievement of universal brotherhood and man's unfoldment of his own spiritual resources well I guess that's all we can do this morning and uh, you are uh, to be congratulated on having two lectures this morning not everybody has two lectures from me in one morning <laughs> so I guess that's the way it's going to be now I have a little announcement here I'd like to make in connection with my wife and her work most of you know that she is interested in a very serious problem in dealing with the birth of a new age and that is something that is needed 
in the 17th century we had a new age which led to the liberation of man's mind from the dismal pressures of medievalism. A new world order seems to be very necessary and my wife has given nearly 50 years of study and thought to this particular problem. She have, we have here on the table this morning this pamphlet which is a, a, called an introduction to the birth of a new age which is really a, a very brief summary of four volumes of work that she has done and uh, the, the volumes are not available at this time that, but a pre-publication copy of these first two volumes can be seen in our library it is available and has to do with the first aspects of her studies and uh, this is can be purchased this pamphlet can be purchased at our uh, in our gift shop and we hope that if you're interested and I think you will be in the great problem that is involved namely the birth of a new age and how we are going to gradually build this better way of life which is necessary as we see the piling up of confusion and complexity so we suggest this to your consideration and thank you very much and hope to see you again pretty soon